So we've been going over the five main fallacious teachings of the dispensational futurist eschatological system. We started off with the pre-tribulation rapture teaching, uh, which teaches that the rapture and the second advent of Christ are two temporally separate events, not the same event. Um, we're going through and refuting that in uh, video one. That's part one. Uh, their second fallacious teaching is the idea that there will be a seven-year period of great tribulation between the rapture and the second advent, and that is taken from a false interpretation of Daniel 9, 24 through 27, that great messianic prophecy. And um, they believe that the uh, 70th week of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy is still future from our time to be fulfilled yet in the future. So that's number two. So the first is the pre-tribulation rapture. Number two is uh, this idea of a seven-year period of tribulation. That's their second main false teaching. The third false teaching would be the rise of the Antichrist or the proper identity of the Antichrist. We went through that. And now we're getting to our fourth issue, which is uh, the Israel issue. Our fifth one will be issues concerning the millennium of Revelation chapter 20. That'll be a big one. But this is, this is pretty big. This is pretty controversial. So in this fourth uh, element, fourth uh, point of dispensational futurist error in their eschatological system is dealing with Israel in Bible prophecy. And we're looking to ask, who is the true Israel of God? Who is real Israel? And I didn't make that up. I got it from somebody else. But I think that's a kind of a play on words. Uh, good question, though. Who is real Israel? Dispensational futurists are fixated on the modern nation-state that calls itself Israel. They fallaciously believe that the modern state of Israel has a pivotal role to play in Bible prophecy. They believe this primarily because of their false interpretation of Daniel 9, 24-27's 70-week time prophecy. Dispensational futurists claim that although the first 69 weeks are 483 literal years, utilizing the day-for-year principle there, uh, that the first 69 weeks of the prophecy was fulfilled with the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem in the first century A.D. And you can see that in Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 19, and John 12. And that the 70th week of the prophecy is still seeking future fulfillment. So although the first 69 weeks were fulfilled in the first century, the 70th week is still seeking future fulfillment even from our time today. Dispensational futurists insert a time gap between the end of the 69th week and the beginning of the 70th week. This time gap is, however, not justified in this or any other time-specific prophecy of Scripture. Once a prophecy begins, a time prophecy, it continues all the way until its end, with no time gaps allowed. According to dispensational futurists, since Daniel's prophecy specifically stated 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city, that is, the Jews and your holy city, Jerusalem, then that means, if the 70th week has not yet been fulfilled, that God still has seven more years in which he will work in, through, and by the Jewish people or the modern Jewish state of Israel. In the dispensational futurist scheme, the Jewish people in Israel will rebuild a third temple in Jerusalem and begin the sacrifices once again. Then, after the church has been taken up in a pre-tribulation rapture, all the prophetic events of the book of Revelation, namely chapters 6 through 19, will begin to unfold. So again, the majority of the book of Revelation, according to dispensational futurism, is still uh, uh, waiting future fulfillment from our time after the rapture. Uh, and the central focus, of course, will be on the nation-state of Israel during that unfolding of that seven years. Um, just a little note that I made before we go over this. I just want to make sure that um, people understand that while God has always had and will continue to have his faithful people among the Jews, I am staunchly opposed to the false prophetic teaching, the teaching of Bible prophecy, that this has anything at all to do with the modern nation-state that calls itself Israel today, or that it has anything to do with the Jewish people as a whole. God has always had his elect among the Jews, and he will continue ha to have his elect among the Jews as well. Um, problem with this idea that God still has plans for the Jewish people as a whole, and the nation of Israel in particular, well, Daniel 9, 24 through 27 is a messianic prophecy that was completely fulfilled in the first century A.D., the final week of that prophecy symbolized 
Christ's three, three and a half year ministry and the subsequent three or three and a half years of the apostles preaching primarily to the Jews before the gospel message goes out to the, the Gentile population at, uh, in large. So the 70th week is not awaiting a future fulfillment. Okay, There is no time left specifically for the Jewish people. 70 weeks are determined about your people. That's the Jewish people. There's no time left, no time prophecy left in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Okay, because the entirety of it has already been fulfilled. The last week, last seven years of prophecy, etc., three and a half, three, three and a half years of Jesus' earthly ministry, and the subsequent three, three and a half years of ministry by the apostles, primarily to the Jews. That's the fullness of the seven years. The 70th week was fulfilled in the first century AD. <clears throat> and just a quick word about false labels that dispensational futurists uh, will use to label the position that I'm going to present uh, in this video from scripture, by the way, some of the false labels to be, um, to listen for, buzz terms to listen for. So while the view to which I hold may falsely be labeled as replacement theology, that's, that's what they, they love to throw that, that label out. Um, dispensational futurists do because they are of course dogmatic about their eschatological system. There is in fact no such thing as replacement theology. I don't believe in any such thing as replacement theology. Okay. The Bible clearly teaches who is the real Israel. There is no replacing of Israel. Rather, there is fulfillment of Israel in Christ and his church. Okay? That Israel is not, is not gone, not put to the wayside. Israel still exists this very day in Christ and in his church. Okay? The term replacement theology is a term that opponents of the biblical position I present uh, used to try and muddy the waters of discussion about this topic. Uh, no one holds the same. No one that holds the position I, I'm presenting in this video would claim to hold to replacement theology. We wouldn't claim for ourselves, "Oh, I'm a replacement theologian." That's a false term that dispensational futurist opponents of my position use. Okay. Um, in fact, no one has replaced Israel as a people. Rather, the Bible clearly teaches a fulfillment of what those who are supposed to be the representatives of God in the Old Testament, namely Israel, with the perfection that is ultimately ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ and all who are in him. Okay. Um, since Christ is the perfect Israel, by extension, all who are in Christ are also the true Israel of God. For example, one of the most important words in Matthew's gospel is the word fulfill. Fulfill. This word comes at some very interesting places in Matthew's Gospel account. We're not going to cover all of them, but a few of them I think will do well. Let's look at some of them. Uh, Jesus uh, as an infant in the flight to Egypt in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, this is also known, he's also known as Herod the Great or Herod the First. Uh, Herod was the Roman client king of Judea from 37 BC to roughly 4 BC. So this would have been before 4 BC because after this incident, Herod will die. And then Joseph and Mary will take the baby Jesus back to uh, their hometown. Um, Herod's father was Antipater the Idumean. Yeah, you probably don't need to know all this stuff. You can look up that for yourself. Um, so, some wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? They recognized Jesus' kingship already as an infant. For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Notice that. They weren't idolaters. They weren't looking to worship a, a mere human being. That would be idolatry. They knew who this was. They came to worship him, king of the Jews, Worship, that's important, um, to talk about uh, Christ's deity. You only worship deity. You don't worship unless you're an idolater. And these men do not appear to have been idolaters. When Herod the king heard this, that these wise men came from the east and were looking for the king of the Jews so that they could worship him, he was troubled. Of course, this would threaten his, <clears throat> his throne. And all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. 
And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Notice that? This one in Bethlehem, born in Bethlehem, will shepherd God's people Israel. And of course, the citation is of Micah 5.2. In other words, Matthew's gospel account in this particular uh, place in Matthew chapter 2 declares that Micah 5 verse 2 was fulfilled in Jesus. Fulfilled in Jesus. That's an important word, fulfilled in Matthew's gospel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Of course, this was a total, a total facade. That's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to kill him. So after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. These were faithful men. And going into the house... And Herod's trying to trying to uh, deceive them here. This is a deception from Herod. You know, let me know where he is, that I can come worship him. Total deception. And going into the house, these wise men, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and again worshipped him. They knew that he was deity. They knew that proposition that Jesus, this king of the Jews, was in fact God, the eternal son of God. Then opening their treasuries and treasures, they offered him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh, and being, notice this, being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph, that's Jesus' adoptive, adoptive father, his earth father, in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Okay? So Herod was a liar when he said, when he figured out where the child is, let me know because I want to worship him too. Total liar. And uh, Joseph rose and took the child and his mother Mary by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. And I think that was roughly 4 BC. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Okay. That's from the prophet Hosea, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Historically, in Hosea 11, 1, go read the text, this text was about Israel. Notice, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So God in the Old Testament, in the prophet Hosea, is saying, Israel is my son, and out of Egypt I have called my son Israel. My son Israel. And notice, Matthew is saying that out of Egypt I called my son, that this is what? Fulfilled in Jesus. Matthew's gospel account declares that this event was fulfilled in Jesus. And this original text is about Israel, my son. Moving on. The, bapti the baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John, John the Baptist, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John the Baptist consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Again, this is my beloved Son. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my Son. See how Jesus is fulfilling the Sonship of God? Uh, not to mention the fact that we actually have an allusion to the doctrine of the Trinity right here. So Jesus, Jesus the Son of God, being baptized, so he's in the water, seeing the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and coming to rest on him and then a voice from heaven the voice can't be from the holy spirit because this voice is from heaven whereas the spirit of god is descending like a dove coming to rest on him and he jesus is in the water so here you have the voice from heaven that's the father's voice you have the holy spirit of god coming to rest on him and of course jesus was conceived by the holy spirit himself and then you have the son 
So you have the doctrine of the Trinity, in a sense, right in this, uh, right in this text. Beautiful. But that's not the point. That's not the focus. I want to. I want to put onto this passage. The voice from heaven said, "This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased." And he had called Israel his son. Remember the words of Hosea 11, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Again, Matthew's Gospel is declaring from Hosea 11.1 1, that it was fulfilled in Jesus. A text that originally applied to Israel is applied to Jesus. Jesus uh, begins his ministry. Now when he heard that John the Baptist had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be, again, there's our word, fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Again, citing from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. Isaiah 9, 1 through 2 is declared by Matthew's gospel to be what? Fulfilled in Jesus. Fulfilled in Jesus. All these things, fulfilled in Jesus constantly. Okay? Dispensational futurists are wrong concerning the modern nation state of Israel and thinking that it has some prophetic importance. They have no seven years left. Uh, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. That's been completed. And then we have these texts talking about, texts that originally talked about Israel in the Old Testament saying, no, fulfilled in Jesus, fulfilled in Jesus. These are important things. Uh, for example, dispensational futures teach that a future Mr. Diabolical, an ind individual uh, human being indwelt by Satan, Antichrist, will sit in a third rebuilt temple in the literal earthly city of Jerusalem, etc., etc. Of course, the temple in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 does not refer to a rebuilt temple. It refers to the church. Um, and I've already gone through this text in my Antichrist video. Uh, the temple is uh, the church, not a third rebuilt temple in Israel. Well, let's go to Israel. So we, we see the fulfillment of Jesus in as Israel in the New Testament. But let's go to Israel in the Bible, in the Old Testament, to the very first time the term Israel is mentioned in the Bible. When it is mentioned, the very first time the term Israel is used, it is a spiritual name given by God to one man who gained a spiritual victory with God and who would become a great nation. This man was not Abraham, but his grandson, Jacob. Jacob. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Jacob, which means, uh, literally means heel catcher. And it, come, it had come to be understood as, a deceiver, one who causes another to stumble, which of course was the summation of Jacob's life, at least uh, in interaction with his brother Esau. And then he himself was uh, deceived um, by Laban. But you can read about that. Uh, this is the, Jacob struggling with God, essentially. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And that's what Israel means. It means striving with God, having or, or striven with God. Right here. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he did bless him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For he said, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Again, Israel, a name given, a spiritual name, given to one man who gained a spiritual victory with God and with men and prevailed with him, not prevailed against him, but prevailed with him and became a great nation. If we look at Jesus, especially with regard to his atoning sacrifice, Jesus was one man who gained a spiritual victory with God and with men and prevailed with him, prevailed with God. Jesus accomplishes what Israel failed to do. All throughout the Old Testament, we have Israel failing, failing, failing to be God's perfect representatives on earth. 
Where Israel fails, Jesus succeeds. Jesus is the real Israel. Let's, um, this is Joseph's dream, and the reason I put this is because we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 12, a really powerful part of Scripture that is really going to solidify who is the real Israel. Uh, Joseph's dream. He dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, of course, but his father kept the saying in mind. That's interesting. But notice the bolded part here. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me, that is, to Joseph. Right? Um, he, uh, Jacob, Israel, was their father. And of course, he had twelve sons. So eleven stars were bowing down to me. That's Joseph. He is the twelfth star. So really, there's twelve stars. Eleven stars bowing down to the twelfth star. So twelve total stars. Sun, moon, and twelve stars. Notice when we get to the New Testament and the book of Revelation, that similar language appears in Revelation chapter 12. I give a little snippet here of the uh, roughly 404 verses in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> of those 404, nearly 278 of them are taken almost word for word from the Old Testament, even while the author gives absolutely no citations. There's no citations at all in the book of Revelation. Nowhere where John the Apostle writes down, as Isaiah said, dot, 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 or as Jeremiah said, dot, dot, dot. He doesn't quote from the Psalter. He doesn't quote anywhere. He doesn't give any citations at all. But nearly of the 404 some odd verses, nearly 278 of those verses are almost directly word for word from the Old Testament. So we are the ones who have to do our homework and research there. So the woman in the wilderness, Revelation chapter 12, notice, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Doesn't that remind you of Joseph's dream in Genesis 37, 9 through 11? It should be. So this woman, clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems, that's seven crowns, royal crowns. And he, uh, his tail swept a third part of the stars of the heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. 1260 days. It is my contention that this woman is not Eve. It is not Mary. It represents Israel, Old Testament Israel, who is seen as a woman. And sometimes when she is uh, being rebellious and disobedient, she is called a prostitute. Okay, so in her disobedience, she's called a, a prostitute in the Old Testament. And when she is faithful, God uh, compares her to a delicate and comely woman, the daughter of Zion. Okay, so this is, my contention is that this woman represents Israel, Israel of the Old Testament, who was pregnant and crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. Okay, and uh, the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore a child, the dragon might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, to a male child. This is the Messiah. It is Israel who brought forth the Messiah. That is the woman. But the child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness. Um, let's go on a little farther in Revelation chapter 12. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But the dragon was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan. Any question on who the great red dragon is? Shouldn't be. 
He is the deceiver of the whole world. And go to John chapter 8, where Jesus talks about um, um, Satan being uh, the, the father of lies. Okay, Similar verbiage used there. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser. He's a, an accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. Okay, so not only does he deceive, but he gives accusations. He makes accusations constantly. And they, that is our brothers, they have conquered him by one, the blood of the lamb, and two, by the word of their testimony. Both of these things. This is why, as a Calvinist, I hold the blood of the Lamb, the atoning sacrificial work of the Christ, in such high regard. I don't view the atoning work of Christ as some uh, peanut butter work made on behalf of every single individual human being without exception, because the blood of the Lamb actually accomplishes the salvation of the brethren by the word of their testimony. So, his sacrifice and the word of their testimony, that is biblical truth, biblical truth. For they love not their lives even unto death. Wow, we can get into that. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Okay? The devil comes down to you in great wrath, primarily through deception. Through deception, through errors, through lies. Okay? Think he attacks Bible prophecy and the proper interpretation of it? Sure he does. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Notice this. Who is that? If the male child has ascended into heaven, who is the woman? Israel. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to a place where she is to be nourished for a time, times, and half a time. Remember that time prophecy. Very important time prophecy given seven times in scripture, twice in Daniel, five times in the book of Revelation. Okay? Notice it's the same woman, the same woman that we started with. Clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, crown of 12 stars, same woman. That's Israel. After the ascension of Christ, it's the same woman. Okay? And she is fleeing into the wilderness where she has a uh, she is to be nourished for a time times half a time or 1260 days the serpent poured water out like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a great flood but the earth came to help the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus Question, again, what does the woman represent? A woman it cannot be a literal woman, Eve or Mary. Rome holds typically that this woman in Revelation chapter 12 represents Mary. This is false. Can't be a literal woman, including Mary, because she is clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. The allusion is clearly back to Genesis 37. This woman is symbolic of the Israel of the Old Testament all the way up until the conception and birth of Christ because she was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. This woman gave birth to a male child. Again, Isaiah 9, 6, for, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. One who is to rule, back to Revelation 12, 5, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Revelation 12, 5 here, her child was caught up to God into his throne, seems to be a reference to the ascension of Jesus into heaven. And this is Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on Jesus, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by, stood by in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And again, think about John 14. I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. Where'd he go? Heaven. Heaven. 
no question about it. The rapture is a biblical doctrine. It's just not a, se a temporally separate event than the second advent. They're the same event. Uh, question, what happens to the woman after the ascension of Christ? The male child answered, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God and which is to be nourished for 1260 days. Again, that's verse 6. Verse 14, the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. That is 1260 days. Check this out. British Methodist theologian and biblical scholar Adam Clark in his Bible commentary, correctly recognized, contrary to both this dispensational futurism and preterism, he recognized the day equals year principle in this time prophecy, as well as the other five places it is mentioned. Okay. Um, again, seven times in Scripture, commenting on the prophecy of Revelation twelve fourteen. Adam Clark writes this. Notice it. Notice what Adam Clark has to say. I complete agreement with him here. Uh, even, the, even though he was uh, an Arminian, I'm a Calvinist. Still totally agree with his eschatological views right here. The apocalypse being highly symbolical, it is reasonable to expect that its periods of time will also be represented symbolically, that the prophecy may be homogenous in all its parts. The Holy Spirit, when speaking of years, symbolically has invariably represented them by days commanding, for example, the prophet Ezekiel to lie upon his left side 390 days, that it might be a sign or symbol of the house of Israel bearing their iniquity as many years, 390 years. And 40 days, Ezekiel was told, to lay upon his right side, or 40 days, excuse me, uh, to represent uh, the house of Judah in a symbolical manner that they should bear their iniquity 40 years. So he's told, lay on your right side 40 days, I've given you a day for a year. See Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. The 1,200 three-score days then, the 1,260 days, the time times half a time, therefore, that the woman is fed in the wilderness must be understood symbolically as well and consequently denote as many natural years. The woman is nourished for 1,200 three-score years from the face of the serpent. So we have seen now that Reformed Baptist theologian John Gill and Methodist theologian Adam Clark were neither preterists nor futurists with respect to Bible prophecy. They were historicists. They both interpreted the day-for-year principle and said that this should be utilized when interpreting the time-specific prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. So back to Revelation chapter 12. If the woman, clothed with the sun, uh, with the moon under her feet, crown of 12 stars, if that represents Israel, and then she brings forth the man-child, and the male child is caught up to his throne, the ascension of Christ, and then she goes into the wilderness because the serpent's after her, the dragon's after her. She goes into the wilderness where she's nourished for 1260 literal years. It's the same woman. That woman, nourished for 1260 years, is obviously the church of Christ. And if the woman in the first verses represent Israel, and Israel is the church. Church is Israel. Revelation chapter 12 is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It totally destroys dispensational futurist ideas that Israel in the Middle East has anything as a major part to play in Bible prophecy. Again, if the pregnant woman of Revelation chapter 12 represents Israel in the Old Testament and is the same woman who was nourished by God for 1260 days, in the time period from, I would say, 538 to 1798 A.D., I think that's the best time period, and that this woman represents the church of Jesus Christ, then that means that the church of Jesus Christ is the true Israel of God. It's the same woman throughout. Okay? Same woman before and during the incarnation. Same woman after his ascension into heaven. Same woman who is nourished for 1260 years, the time of the, roughly the time of the Middle Ages and even beyond that point. So far from the idea that Christ's church replaces Israel, she is Israel, because Jesus is the real Israel. He's the fulfillment of the real Israel, and all who are in him are members of the true Israel. Okay. The failure to interpret the time-specific prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, especially the 1260 days or 42 months, time, times, half a time prophecy, found seven times in Scripture, is one of the reasons dispensational futurists are fixated on the modern nation state that calls itself Israel for the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. They believe Daniel's 70th week is still needs to be fulfilled, and they believe that that 1260 days, 42 months, time times half a time, 
is a part of that 70th week, that seven years. And so they interpret the 1260 days literally as a three and a half year time period. Okay. Um, and that's a problem. It's a, it's a, it's an inconsistency in their, their her hermeneutic, their, their interpretive methodology. If they're using the day for year principle in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, which they do, but then they abandon the day for year principle when it comes to the 1260 days, 42 months, time, times, half a time, that's an inconsistency. Okay. That's not consistent. Uh, seven years remain, etc. Dispensational futurists fail to recognize Jesus Christ as the perfect fulfillment of all the Old Testament, of all that Old Testament Israel failed to do. And they fail to recognize that as the real Israel, all his people, both believing Jews and Gentiles, make up the real nation or kingdom of Israel. Let's look at Abraham, the father of the faithful, and what the Bible has to say about him and his relationship to the church. So when John the Baptist saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 and 9. See also Luke 3, 8. <clears throat> Paul, writing to the churches in Galatia, writes pretty extensively about this subject. Paul writes, Know then that it is, of, it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Those who are faith are the sons of Abraham. In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you, Abraham, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And if you notice, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, In you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's a direct citation of Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where he says, where God says to Abraham, uh, uh, I shall bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've listened to dispensational futurists on the radio talking about the modern nation state of Israel and some particular uh, political going on over there and how the United States should handle political diplomacy with Israel and the countries around it, etc. And saying, hey, the Bible says I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Totally ripping Genesis chapter 12, verse 3 out of its context and abusing the text. Abusing the text. When Paul himself cites Genesis 12, verse 3 in Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 8. Okay, they think that this, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, dispensate, these dispensational futurists say that, hey, that applies to the modern nation state of Israel today. Has nothing to do with it. That's an abuse of Scripture. Genesis 12.3 is one of the most abused texts of Scripture by dispensational futurists who claim that this text applies to how modern peoples in the world should treat the modern nation state of Israel. Dispensational futurists will rip this passage out of its proper context and audaciously apply it to the modern state of Israel. But the Bible has a completely different application than what dispensational futurists falsely teach all because of their erroneous eschatological system that they are dogmatic about. Look at Paul says this is about the church. Those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham. And this is the fulfillment of, in you shall all the nations be blessed, from Genesis 12, 3. Okay? Speaking to Abraham directly, and I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, Abraham. Okay? In Christ Jesus, Paul says in Galatians 3.14, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Galatians 3.16, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one offspring, who is Christ. Christ, the one offspring of Abraham. And in Christ Jesus, you all are sons of God 
writing to the churches in Galatia, predominantly Gentile churches. You are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, nor, nor male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And check this out. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Okay? Are unbelieving Jews Abraham's offspring? No, they are not. If they are not believers in the gospel concerning Jesus Christ, they are not Abraham's offspring. Why do you think John the Baptist told the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees? and He said, do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham or we are, as our father, we are Abraham's offspring. For I tell you, of these stones, God is able to raise up seed unto Abraham. Romans 4.11, Abraham received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was yet uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised. And this is, he's talking about religious circumcision, not, you know, little baby boys being circumcised in the hospital before they go home or something. That's not, that's not what he's talking about, the religious ceremonial working of circumcision okay but he is the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well romans 4 16 that is why it depends on faith in order that promise the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring not only to the adherent of the law but also to the one who shares the faith of abraham who is the father of us all writing to Rome, the, the church in Rome. Again, a predominantly Gentile church. Predominantly Gentile church. And this is, this is probably the greatest section right here concerning this issue of who is real, is real. This is Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to go through 11 through, did I do the whole rest of it? Yeah. Verse 20, yeah, verse 22. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, who were called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, you were called the uncircumcision by the Jews, who were called the circumcision, which is made uh, in the flesh by hands. Remember that you, you Gentiles, you uncircumcision, you non-Jews, were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. And you were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Again, as a Calvinist, I hold the blood of Christ in the highest regard because it brings us close. It brought us close to the commonwealth of Israel, non-strangers, strangers no more, having hope and with God in the world. For he himself, is our peace, who has made us both one, and has what? Broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Dispensational futurists want to want to erect walls where the blood of Christ and Christ himself has broken down this dividing wall. Dispensational futurists want to want to build that wall back up again and say, well, after the rapture, that wall will be built back up again. No, it won't. It won't ever be built up again. That dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, most likely the ceremonial rit ritualistic law, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Is he going to resurrect the hostility again? No. No. That, that killing of the hostility, that a uh, hostility that'll never be resurrected again. But dispensational futurists would have to teach otherwise. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. 
For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are fellow citizens of what? Of what? Fellow citizens of where? The commonwealth of Israel. <laughs> That's gorgeous. That's a wonderful thing right there. And the saints, with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom, Christ Jesus, the whole structure being joined together, grows into what? And holy temple in the Lord. Again, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, where the man of sin, son of perdition, the Antichrist, sits in the temple of God, claiming to be God and all that. What temple does he sit in? He sits in the church. He's a professing Christian. In fact, he professes to be the head of all Christians on earth. People even call him Holy Father, which is a term that's only used once in Scripture in John chapter 17. And Jesus, it's Jesus' high priestly prayer. Holy Father. And yet, the Bishop of Rome uses that as a title for himself. You want to talk about arrogance. No. Believers in Christ Jesus. Believe, we're, we're not perfect. Not perfect in any way, shape, or form. Not, not claiming that at all. You want to talk about the worst of sinners, I'm it. Okay? Not perfect. But we are the church. The temple of the living God on earth. No longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens of what? The commonwealth of Israel. That's what we are. Doesn't matter what your ethnic background is. If you're a believer in the gospel of Christ, you are part of the Israel of God. Amazing. My conclusion to all this, uh, the church of Christ Jesus is the real Israel of God. The church is Abraham's offspring. The church are heirs according to God's promise to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. Uh, much more could be said concerning this issue, but I, I, I really think that the focus upon Daniel 9, 24 through 27 and recognizing that that, that 70th week is, is expired. It was expired in the first century. And Revelation chapter 12, which connects the woman who starts out being pregnant, bringing forth the man-child, that's Israel. And then once she brings forth the man-child, and the male child is caught up to God and to his throne, the ascension of Jesus, and the serpent goes out, that drag, the devil, the, the devil comes out to pursue the woman, and she is nourished for 1260 literal years. That's the church. So the woman is the same throughout. That's Israel. Israel is the church. The church is Israel. Okay? There is no distinction there. There's no different plans that God has for Israel versus the church. We are all one in Christ Jesus. All believers in the gospel concerning the Christ are of the household of God and of the commonwealth of Israel, no longer strangers. Okay? Don't let dispensational futurists build up walls that Christ and the apostles came and totally obliterated. Don't let them build those walls back up again. Those are false walls. They don't belong there. Israel has never gone away. Israel has always been on the earth since the time of Christ and the apostles, of course, and beforehand. It remains to this day, regardless what some modern nation state in the Middle East calls itself. They can call themselves Israel all they want. Bible-believing Christians know who the true Israel of God is, and that's Christ and his church, along with all the saints from the Old Testament time period. That's all the Israel of God. Okay? Again, this is a big controversial subject. There are some nasty things that would be said about uh, people like me who hold this view, the biblical view. I think I've established that. Um, some, some nasty things would be said about people like me. Uh, but uh, we need to look past those types of ad hominem type arguments. I hope this is edifying and helpful. Post your comments, questions down below. Let me know what you're thinking about all that with respect to Israel and the Israel of God. Who is real Israel? That's the question. We'll talk to you soon. Soli Deo Gloria.